um, but what are some what are some student answers that could possibly impress the admission officer of those of those questions that you yeah asked? um again i think i would say just be yourself um you know this isn't something that it's not, this isn't a test right so there aren't really any like you know for the most part any right or wrong answers um i think when you talk about what you're passionate about uh those are the things that we like to see because oftentimes like we can see a student's eyes light up when they start talking about um, that one thing that they're super passionate about um, and, and why it's important to them. Um, and so we really are just trying to get to know you. Um, and so um, I, I would say that there's not necessarily a specific answer to any kind of question that I think is gonna be like, oh, well, this is super impressive. Um, we really are just trying to get a better sense of who you are in the context of you, right? We're not comparing you to the person before you or the person after you. This isn't like a competition or anything. This is really just getting to know you in the context of you. And next week you'll hear me say that the, the essays are to learn about you in the context of your school. Um, but really this, this particular thing how much weight is the interview in the application process? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think you want to ask each college that and see um, from school to school. I would say most colleges um, are, are review applications holistically. And so um, this is just one more tool. I often think of the application process, and, and some of you may have heard me use this metaphor before, but um, I think of the application process as a puzzle. Um, and everything that you submit is just one puzzle piece, right? Your grades are one puzzle piece. Your test scores are one puzzle piece. Your letters of recommendation are just one puzzle piece. Your activities are one puzzle piece. This interview is just one puzzle piece. And what we're trying to do as admissions counselors is put the pieces together to see what that whole picture is of you as a person. Um, and so we weigh that pretty equally with everything else. Um, sometimes we might, usually interviews are optional. Require as their admissions entry program. Um, I almost, I almost require it for all my international students. Um, I'll make exceptions here and there, but I almost do require it for my international students um, just because there's added challenges uh, of navigating admissions um, into a whole new country. And so, um, you know, I think uh, really just depends from college to college uh, as far as what kind of weight they put on it. Uh, but for the most part, it's just one additional puzzle piece. It's one additional source. Most colleges, interviews are optional, so they don't require it. Um, schools that do require it, I would is that's probably a hint that the interviews are a pretty key and important piece. Um, a lot of schools where that's also true, often use the interview as part of uh, the decision-making process for like financial aid or, uh, not financial aid, I'm sorry, um, for scholarships. Um, and so again, that's gonna differ from school to school. At Reed specifically, your the type of kind of the, the amount of money that you get for financial aid has nothing to do with the interview. Have an advantage if they get interviewed, uh, to as opposed to the people who don't get interviewed. Will everyone in uh, who gets interviewed get get accepted? You know, what's the what's the deal with the yeah. advantage or disadvantage? Yeah, good question. I think um, I would say. For the most part, no, um, you don't necessarily have an advantage. Um, like, that's why it's an optional piece. Um, we literally just don't have the capacity. We get 8,000 applications a year. It, we don't have the capacity to interview 8,000 students. Um, and we admit students all the time who've never interviewed. However, that being said, I do think there are a lot of, there are way more pros to interviewing then there are cons, and I, and I can't even really think of any cons to interviewing. Um, again, this is all about that demonstrated interest piece, right? At least for Reed, um, but for a lot of colleges. Um, so by signing up for an interview and attending that interview, that is a really big demonstrated interest piece. That, that shows us that you're really interested in the college. Um, the other, the other, I think maybe place where it might give you a leg up is building that relationship with your admissions counselor, right? If I interview you and we end up having a really great conversation, there's a good chance I'm gonna remember your name um, or remember you as a whole 
much better than maybe a person that um, I don't interview. And when I come across your application, I'll, you know, that name might trigger and say, oh yeah, I remember, you know, I, I, um, I talked to Jason before. Um, and we had a really great conversation. Um, and uh, I remember that interview and I might go, you know, uh, and, and maybe I don't, and I, but I have the notes next to me to jog on my memory. Um, and so I think in that case, you know, I, that relationship building with your admissions counselors, I think that's where that comes in handy. Um, it's also just a great way for you to interview the school. I think I touched on that in the presentation, um, but this is an opportunity for you to ask your questions as well. Uh, and don't be afraid to be tough. Uh, with your questions, right? If there are things that you're curious about, feel free to ask. This is your opportunity to ask someone from the college one-on-one, -on -one, uh, as opposed to a larger group setting, um, what your questions might be. Um, and so if your question is a little bit more specific about your specific scenario, that's a great place to do that. Um, and so while there's there's no like official or or you know anything like that in terms of a leg up, I think uh, inadvertently there you know, there, there can be um, some positive bias towards folks that have interviewed. Um, there's a question here in the chat box. Is it recommended to do an interview only after submission of the application to let the admission officer get to know? That's a really good question. Um, you don't have to. If like, I think that's my personal preference is to do that, um, is, is to sign up for an interview after you've submitted your application, um, just because that gives me something to look at uh, about you. But by no means is that a requirement. Um, you're welcome to submit your, or you're welcome to interview before your, um, your application and still have a really great conversation um, and, and talk a little bit more about you and your academics and your interests and extracurriculars and, and passions, um, even without the application. So um, I, think, I think sometimes the preference is to have it, but if you don't, don't let that stress you out. Um, and I would suggest to still go ahead and sign up for the interview. And you also alluded to the fact that, um, you know, there's like 8,000 applicants and you have to have a select pool of, of interviews. Um, so how do you guys select who to interview? Is there a certain process? Yeah, great question. Uh, usually we, there is no selection process. If you sign up and there's really a slot available, we'll interview you. Um, sometimes um, when it comes to something like, like an, right now is COVID, um, th there might be a limit of like, uh, we're only going to allow on-campus interviews to students who have submitted an application. Um, also, like, I think I talked about this in the presentation as far as timing is considered. Like, if you're a junior, but you want to interview, we might email you back and say, why don't you hold off and either wait until the spring or wait until the fall of your senior year, because we want to open that, we leave that slot open for um, potential seniors that want to interview right now. Uh, but otherwise, um, we, we try to make an effort to interview any student that apply, that that requests one. Uh, and as far as I can um, remember, there's never been a year where we've had to like turn down a bunch of people and just say, we're not interviewing you now or, or had to be selective about our interviews. Usually um, just by the sheer natural process and order of things, um, you know, we were able to get through these interviews. And, and sometimes that just means um, a lot of people doing a lot of interviews for a couple of weeks and that's okay. Um, you know, we have student staff and student interns that can help us with that. We have alumni that can help us with that. Um, you know, we're doing them. Um, all the admissions counselors are, are doing interviews right now. Um, and we're each doing like, uh, you know, six to 10 a week uh, at this point. Um, so, um, you know, there's still, you know, if you want to chat with us, we want to honor that request and honor that that conversation. Um, and we really want to get to know you too. Um, so, you know, we, we try not to um, turn anyone away. On-site interviews, you go into a coffee shop and then you take notes and then, um, and then once you leave, you know, you go back to the office, you review the applicant. What is the process there? What What is the behind the scenes when you go back to the office and, and uh, check up on uh, the notes for the interview? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we typically type up these notes. Uh, if, if we did it on paper, we'll type it up. Um, if we already typed it up, then we'll just copy it and paste it into the application or um, whatever submission system that we're using. Um, 
And uh, then later down the road, when we're, when we're reviewing your application, um, your, uh, we have a, a data processing team that um, attaches your, the application notes that we submitted, or excuse me, the um, interview notes that we submitted to your application. So even if we interview you, but we don't have an application, we have a, a system that um, looks to connect these two. So once I have an application in your name, or, or sorry, my gosh. Once I have an interview uh, with interview notes in your name, and then we suddenly receive an application with that same name, an alert goes off for our data processing team. And um, they make sure that the notes match the person that the application is for, uh, because you know sometimes people have the same names. Um, and once that's verified, um, we attach those notes. And then later on, when I go and review your application, along with all of the, uh, the materials that we're looking at, your, our notes will be there. It'll pop up uh, with the rest of your materials. Um, and so I'll go back and read those um, or someone else interviewed you like a student or another admissions counselor or uh, an alumni. Um, I can read their notes uh, and, and vice versa. They can read my notes if I interview one of their students. Um, and you know, we've all been trained on, on how to uh, do these interviews and, and what kind of notes to take and, and what's worthy of writing down and um, you know, what's that is that not worthy of writing down, but just that like, you know, what is it that, um, what kind of information we're we looking for, right? Like information about your extracurriculars, your interests, your passions. Those are the kinds of things that we're writing down. Um, and then um, we have those to supplement the rest of the material. Again, going back to that uh, puzzle analogy, that's just uh, another puzzle piece that we have in front of us. Uh, Shane asked a great question. Is it helpful to submit a third party interview? You definitely can. Uh, I know there are a lot of third party interview organizations out there, um, especially for international students, but I, I know a lot of domestic students will use those as well. Um, and you're welcome to do that. I'm, I would say, you know, reach out to the college uh, uh, that you're looking at um, to see if they have an interview process of their own. And sometimes it might make more sense to just go through the college's process because usually it's free. Um, and the third party interview companies tend to charge uh, quite a bit of money. Um, and even then, I've had to re-interview people uh, after a third party's already interviewed people just because um, I still wanna get to know that student or maybe there's some information that we didn't get answered in the interview from the third party. Um, so you might end up having to do it anyways. Um, so my recommendation is to interview just directly through the school and, and cut out that middle person. Um, but it's, it's, it's not the worst thing to do um, uh, through a third party oftentimes. Um, uh, that's that's a great option as well. Um, if you're an international student, uh, one of the other things that we're assessing um, that's a little bit different is also English proficiency. Um, so you know we're trying to uh, to make sure that your level of proficiency uh, it, within that conversation is also going to be um, one that's going to allow you to be successful uh, at our respective institutions. Professional should we use big words um, or should we? you know, more conversational, something like that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, this is really meant to be informal and casual, right? Like, like I said earlier, this isn't a job interview. Um, don't feel like you have to, to crack out the thesaurus uh, in this conversation. It really is uh, much more conversational than that and much more informal than that. Um, I would say, uh, Imagine standing in line, uh, uh, line uh, at a coffee, um, in line for coffee or for lunch, where you're talking to a stranger, right? And it's 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 informal, it's more casual, um, but you're not necessarily talking like you would with your best friend. So it's not that level of informal where you're like dropping f bombs or um, other kind of derogatory language. Um, so don't get that informal. Um, but uh, you know talk to us how you would talk to 
you know, any just friendly stranger on the on the road, um, whether you're waiting in line somewhere uh, and just striking up a conversation. Um, I think that's kind of the analogy or the thought process I would go into this. Um, you know, we're not looking for you to to wear a three piece suit or uh, you know a full you know dress or anything like dress how you want to as as long as you're comfortable and and. Um, Come ready to talk about you and your your academics and um, your passions and interests and extracurriculars and um, you know what kind of movies you like and music and um, I, I sometimes joke it's a lot like speed dating uh, but in the academic sphere uh, is is what these interviews often remind me. Does campus life at college differ from high school? Um, is how how much more rigorous is it? Um, what what can I do to to make the best of my resources at college? Yeah, that's a those are some great questions. Um, yeah, college is vastly different than school high school. Uh, you know, from as early as kindergarten all the way through your senior year, things are much more structured, right? They're much more rigid. Um, you know, you have classes every day, five days a week, from you know seven thirty in the morning to three or 4 p.m. in the afternoon. Um, you know, you might have seven or eight periods uh, in a day. Um, college is very much not like that. Um, there might be days where you have no classes on Mondays and Wednesdays, and all your classes are on Tuesdays and Thursdays, or maybe you only have class Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, instead of like 30, 45 minute classes, sometimes these are two hour long classes, three hour long classes. When I was um, when I was in college, I had a couple of classes that were once a week for four and a half hours uh, or four hours, uh, and I almost preferred that because I only had to go once a week as opposed to two two hour sessions. Um, and that that four hour it was hard to get through because it's four hours of sitting there. Uh, they, they're usually good about giving you breaks uh, every every hour hour and a half or so. So it's not really just sitting there for four hours straight. But uh, and I also most classes that are four hours, the professors usually let you out early anyways. Um, but, uh, you know, things are a little bit less structured, but because of that, it requires you to have a lot more time management skills, right? Because there's not going to be somebody there that necessarily tells you, like, are you getting your homework done? Did you do this assignment? Um, I think the biggest motivator for me when I went to college to do my actual homework or to get things done um, is the fact that I was paying for it. When you're paying for a class uh, and you like slack off, that's an expensive slack off, right? That's an expensive uh, way to waste time. Um, and so that was something that helped me stay motivated is I'm paying for this. Like I better pay attention and I better, uh, you know, get my uh, money's worth. Um, and so um, things are a little less rigid. Uh, you know, you might have one class and then you might have like, um, you might meet up with a group of friends and study together for the rest of the day. Um, or just because you don't have classes that day doesn't mean, um, you know, there's nothing going on. You might have um, labs or you might have um, research that you need to do or, or writing papers or doing other kind of homework. So um, while there's less of that rigid structure, um, you know, there is there are still other things that are happening um, outside of the classroom experience that are gonna take up a little bit more of your time. But college is also about doing really fun and uh, new things, right? There's um, clubs, the, the, just like the sheer number of like clubs that colleges have um, for you to build community and meet other people. Uh, colleges often plan fun events uh, for students to do. At Reed, we have something called the Gray Fund, which is a set of dollars that we set aside every semester for students to um, attend events and activities uh, that they don't wouldn't normally get to do. Um, at uh, you know other other chances like I'll, I'll give you a great example. Um, last October, uh, students had the opportunity to sign up to go skydiving, uh, and we took a bus full of students to an airstrip, and they all hopped on a plane and got to go skydiving. Uh, you don't get to do that in high school, right? Uh, you know, we'll bring in guest speakers or we'll take students on. Um, like to film festivals or art galleries. Um, so these are different things that you can, you have opportunities to do that you didn't necessarily get to get to do uh, while you were in um, high school. 
Uh, I love the question about the level of rigor. College is harder, obviously, than um, high school, but I like to think of it this way. I, I think of them as like steps, right? Like ninth grade uh, was harder than when you were in eighth grade, right? It was just one step up. You know, junior year of high school is, a, is one step higher than sophomore year of high school, right? That, that step from senior year of high school and into college, that step is just maybe a little bit higher depending on the college that you're going to. Um, Reed is among one of the most rigorous institutions in the US. And so depending on what you've done in high school to prepare yourself for that, um, that step can be different, right? If you took all IB classes, well, then you're kind of used to that, that heavy amount of of rigor and coursework. Um, and so that, that step might be a, a little bit higher uh, or maybe it won't be as, as, um, as high as you think it's going to be. And really that's just gonna depend on what kind of preparation work you've had leading up to college. But college is not meant to be easy. College is not meant to be something that you, um, you breeze through. College is meant to stretch you and to challenge you and to help you to think more critically. Um, and it's there to provide you with skill sets that you aren't able to get um, oftentimes elsewhere. Uh, and I'll be the first person to say, you know, um, there are all kinds of colleges out there and all kinds of opportunities out there. And there's over 4,000 colleges. Sometimes that college is not going to be the right fit for you. Um, so if you don't get accepted to a college, that doesn't say anything about you as a person. Um, that just means that that college just wasn't going to be a good fit for you, right? We're trained to, to look at those things. Um, and it would, I would be doing you a disservice uh, to allow you to come to this institution if I didn't think you were gonna be um, prepared for that or ready for that. And, and sometimes you could very well be different or there might be a limit to the number of um, possibilities in which we can accept students, right? At Reed, we cap our class. We don't go over like 450 students every incoming cycle. And we get 8,000 applications a year. So we have to be a little bit more selective. Um, so like I said, just because that college doesn't accept you, it does not say a single thing about you. It does not say anything about the quality of who you are as a person. It does not say anything about who you are as the quality of a student or the quality of a learner. That just means that there's another institution that's going to be out there for you. And like I said, there's 4,000 colleges worldwide. There are a lot of options. I promise you there's a place for you in higher ed. Um, and even though I work here at a private school, um, there are all kinds of types of colleges, right? There's private, there's public. Um, community college is often overlooked. I did the community college thing. I did community college for two years and then went to a large state school. And honestly, my community college experience was almost better than my state school experience. And oftentimes I wish I could go back um, because I, I loved that experience so much. Uh, so there are, and then there's vocational types of schools um, that provide more hands-on type of learning. Um, and these are really great opportunities as well. What's the financial aid look like at Reed? Yeah, so financial aid at Reed, and I would say make sure every college you're looking at, make sure you look at what the um, financial aid process looks like because it's not the same for every college. Um, so for us, we require um, the, the FAFSA. So that's that same financial aid application that most colleges require. Um, if you haven't already started that, you should, if you're a senior, um, that will open up on October 1st. Uh, so uh, make sure you are you're getting on that. This is your reminder if you haven't already. Um, but you'll complete the FAFSA, make sure you include Reed as one of the schools to send your scores to, uh, not your scores, I mean your, um, your financial aid data to. Um, we also require a secondary financial aid application called the CSS profile. Um, and this is a financial aid application through the College Board um, that's a little bit more detailed than the FAFSA and it asks for a few different things. Um, and so then uh, we do require both if you want financial aid at Reed. Um, Reed is, uh, has committed to meeting the demonstrated financial need of every single admitted student for all four years. Um, so 
We don't do anything based off merit. Um, there are no scholarships that read. It's 100% need-based aid. So what that looks like is once you've submitted your financial aid applications um, and once you're accepted to read, we'll then provide you something we call the financial aid uh, award letter um, or financial aid package uh, is what some schools call it. Um, and this is uh, basically a letter uh, that breaks down all the different funding sources that we will be providing you with. Um, um, most of your funding at Read will come in the form of grants. Uh, so grants is money you do not have to pay back. Um, there might be a small chunk of student loans, and then there'll most likely also be a work study. Now, student loans, uh, we keep them as minimal as possible. We want a little bit of skill in the game. Um, but also, um, Reed has the lowest amount of student loan debt out of any school in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we're top three on the West Coast and top 10 in the nation for lowest amount of student loan debt out of any school. Um, and so, uh, you know, like I said, we do really keep them at, at a bare minimum. Um, and then a work study is usually a job on campus. Um, and we give you a job for like five to 10 hours a week, uh, usually working in one of the offices. Um, so you're working like potentially in the admissions office or financial aid or the sports center or the library. Um, you know, one of these areas um, where you're working a couple hours a week um, and earning a paycheck. Uh, and then you can use that paycheck however you want to support yourself, um, whether it's like books and supplies or housing, or if you're living off campus, you can use it to help pay for rent um, or food or whatever you want to use that money for. If you need to buy a new laptop, um, whatever it is that you need to in order to support your, uh, your, your educational process or some combination of the three. So we provide you all of that. Um, I have to consider in order to, to find the right fit for, for the college I want to be in. Yeah, finding the right fit school is like the biggest hurdle that you're gonna face, I feel like. Uh, or for, I don't even like that word fit, but just finding the school that you think is gonna be a place that you enjoy. Um, and I would say approach, approach this in this kind of manner. And this is how I approach a lot of things. This is how I approach. I'm currently house shopping right now and trying to buy a new house. Um, and this is how I'm approaching house buying. This is how I approached buying a car when I bought a car like 10 years ago. Uh, these are all the, this is sort of what's helped me. And this is this, the biggest suggestion that I give students when it comes to like narrowing schools down. Like I said, there's 4,000 schools. So uh, even if you were going to narrow that down to just schools in the US, that's like 2000 schools. Um, so there's still a lot to narrow things down from. What I do is create lists, right? I, I create a list of what is it that I'm looking for? And this is a really introspective skill set to have, right? To sit down, remove all distractions and just dedicate that time to think, what, am it, what is it that I want? What is it that I'm, what is it that I enjoy about my current high school experience and how might that relate to uh, in college? What is it that I don't like about high school and that I don't ever want to experience that in college? You know, these are the things to think about, right? So things like the size of the school. Are you looking for a small school? Are you looking for a medium-sized school um, or a large school? Small schools are usually between like a couple hundred students to a couple of thousand students. Um, Read really is a small school, we're 1400 students. Um, medium schools are usually um, somewhere between five, you know, five to 8,000 students all the way up to about 50, 10 to 15,000 students. Large schools are like 15,000 plus. I went to a large school. I went to a school of like 30,000 students. Um, so that's something to think about is what is it size wise, there's pros and cons to each of these, right? So then to start making lists of, or, or to do some research on what are these pros and cons. Um, another thing to think about are, you know, what kind of uh, interests do you have, right? Both academic and extracurricular and do those schools offer it, right? Because if you are very, if you have your heart set on a major, um, like you're looking for neuroscience, I'm gonna tell you right now, not a lot of colleges offer that as a bachelor's degree. That right there narrows your search down to a, a handful of schools. Um, and there's a lot of search engines out there that helps you do this narrowing down um, where you can plug in some of the filters that you're looking for. And then it pulls up a list of colleges that meet all of your requirements. 
do you care about athletics? Do you care about school spirit? Do you care about fraternities and sororities? Do you care about research opportunities? Um, are you looking for a school that has study abroad programs? What kind of financial aid situation are you looking for? Um, you know, these are all the kinds of things that you um, want to think about uh, when, when making a decision to narrow a school down. Um, and then do that research and then start to narrow that down to the, that, like I always say, make a top 10 list. Um, and once you have that top 10 list, uh, that's when you start to do the research and reaching out to the schools, right? Um, reach out to those admissions counselors, attend those uh, virtual sessions uh, to, and, and start building those connections to learn more about the school. Also talk to your guidance counselors. They know way more about schools than you will, you will ever be you know, um, surprised to hear about. So 